Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar on reporting, recording, and analysing crash data. My name is Ross Morlock. I'm a director here at Break, the road safety charity, and I lead Break's global fleet team, uh, where we work with fleet operators and suppliers to share resources and best practice across the industry. You should all now be able to see my presentation on your screen and hear the audio alongside it. As attendees, you are all muted, um, so you don't need to worry about any background noise from your offices. Today's webinar is made up of pre-recorded presentations from three guest speakers. Steve Reed from the Transport Safety Research Group at Loughborough University, Laurent De Costa from Volvo Group Truck Technology, and Andrew Drury from Broadspire. I'm delighted that both Steve and Laurent are joining us live today as well and are available at the end of the webinar to answer any questions you may have. There are two ways to put forward your questions to us. Firstly, there is a chat box on the webinar panel where you can send your question at any point during the webinar. Alternatively, there is a raise hand icon on the same panel. You can press this during the Q&A session at the end of the webinar and we will unmute you and you can put your question uh, to the panel then directly over the phone. Now I just want to take the opportunity to give you a very brief overview of BREAK, who we are, what we do and before we start um, with the first presentation. So BREAK is a national road safety charity that exists to stop the needless deaths and serious injuries that happen on roads every day. We want to make streets and communities safer for everyone and care for families bereaved and injured in road crashes. Our vision is, is quite simple, um, a world that has zero road deaths and injuries and a world where people can get around in ways that are safe, sustainable, fair and healthy. We promote road safety awareness, safe and sustainable road use and effective road safety policies through campaigns, community education, information and advice for organisations operating fleets of vehicles and road safety professionals, and of course, by running the UK's flagship road safety event, Road Safety Week, which took place this year at the end of November. We also provide essential support to people um, across the UK devastated by road deaths and serious injuries to help them in their darkest hours. So in terms of that support, um, we run a helpline in the UK for people bereaved and seriously injured in road crashes. Um, you've got some statistics and information on screen now, um, which demonstrates the support our helpline um, provides, um, and in particular the level of support um, that we provided um, in 2016. In addition to the helpline, um, we also provide support literature and work very closely with police forces throughout the UK so that when someone does receive that knock on the door from a family, family liaison officer, they are providing them with best practice support literature. Campaigns. We campaign nationally and regionally to raise awareness among the public and to lobby government and push for change in road safety legislation. An example of this is our 2016 Roads to Justice campaign, which centres around getting justice for bereaved families. The campaign launched outside Parliament and gained a lot of media attention, and you will have all seen the recent changes um, to criminal driving sentencing. We also do a lot of campaigning more generally on raising awareness of a range of topics, um, some of which you can see on your screen now. A raising when, um, awareness raising in communities. Um, awareness raising and education in communities is delivered through projects such as our Beep Beep Days. Every year, thousands of tots and infants aged two to seven take part in a special Beat Beat Day organised by their school, uh, their nursery, their playgroup, or, or even their childminder. 
They are a great way to engage children with the road safety basics through fun activities and while raising awareness among parents and the wider community about protecting children on our roads. It's also a great way for corporates such as yourselves to engage with um, your local communities through um, your support and involvement in the day's activities. We also share training, tools and guidance on global fleet safety best practice through our Brake Professional Membership Service that I'm sure many of you um, are familiar with. We provide our members with tools to manage um, occupational road risk regardless of budget, fleet size or vehicle type. We run an annual calendar of events, um, including webinars such as, um, such as today's, and seminars th and training throughout the year. Um, we also have um, annual flagship events, such as our Fleet Safety Conference and Fleet Safety Awards, that I know many of you are also familiar with. In addition to these events, we also produce a lot of resources for employers, including guidance reports um, on introducing policies and sharing best practice case studies. Alongside that, uh, we provide employers with tools to use directly with their drivers. And you can see on screen now some of the posters, infographics um, and resources um, you can use to engage your own drivers. If you have any questions or would like to find out um, how you can get more involved with us here at Brake, um, you can drop us an email at uh, professional at break.org.uk and we're more than happy to have a discussion with you. So, on to today's webinar. Um, the presentations today will last for approximately um, 35 minutes. Um, and as I referred to earlier, there'll be plenty of time at the end to, to ask any questions should you have them. Without further ado, um, we'll start the first of our presentations now. Um, so I'd like to hand you over to Steve Reed at the Transport Safety Research Group at Loughborough University, who's going to talk us through um, the academic framework around collision investigation. Hello everybody. Um, for the next 10 minutes, I'm going to cover the academic perspective of collision investigation. Now, this isn't going to be prescriptive. I don't think it's going to be possible to spell out a full collision investigation, investigation methodology in 10 minutes. But it should provide, provide some ideas and information on things like identifying data that's important to us, making sure the data, data is relevant, ensuring the investigation covers all the factors we're interested in, and selecting the crashes to investigate. So before we start the main presentation, I thought I'd just introduce myself a little so you can see the type of work I've been involved in. Hopefully give you a bit more of an idea of what angle I'm coming from really. So our main expertise in real world in-depth collision investigation, so the group crashes that actually happen out there in the real world. I've been doing this now for about 15 years for a variety of purposes but stems from a theoretical sort of engineering background and from working with full-scale crash tests. So this broadly means I have a more forensic approach to investigations rather than a human factors approach. In other words, I'm happier when a vehicle or a scene tells me something or provides me information rather than a human. So what do we do at Loughborough University? Um, being an academic institution means we can be independent. Um, we don't go into collision investigations with preconceived ideas. We don't deal with fault or blame. They're not part of what we talk about. So generally, uh, collision investigations we work on cover two broad areas. And these are retrospective accident investigations and scene-based. So retrospective is, as you probably gathered by the name, after the event. Um, we would typically investigate vehicles, infrastructure, and even occupant injuries um, after the collisions occur, maybe sometimes up to weeks after they happen, and these determine things like safety performance of vehicles, effectiveness of crash safety sort of mechanisms. So for this, we don't necessarily need to go to this collision scene immediately. Um, if all we're interested in is, is vehicle damage, for example, or a bent piece of infrastructure. And also, complementing this is our scene-based stuff, where we try and attend the scene of collision as soon as possible, um, just after it occurred. For this, we had our own police vehicle, um, so we could get there under blues. Um, this is how 
we collected what, what we consider as volatile data. So things like interviews with road users, skip marks, debris fields, things that change very quickly after the after the um, collision, and it's very important to go and collect. Of course, these can get a bit mixed up. Uh, we could, for example, conduct a scene examination as soon as possible, just do the scene, and then we'd investigate the vehicle later. But there's these two general broad areas we'd, we'd be focusing on. The types of work we've kind of covered would be you know, injuries to car occupants, understanding how people get injured in cars, understanding how the vehicles perform in the real world. We do that for vans, heavies, as well as passenger vehicles. We looked at vulnerable road users. We continue to do that as they become more uh, more a target for us. Things like cyclists and power two wheelers, particularly. We have a special focus on fatal crashes, and we'd also involve things like specials, what we'd consider special, so interesting crashes or unusual crashes. We'd go and have a look at to see if there's any other things we can find out. So the first thing I want to start when we get into the main body of this, and I'll start with something rather controversial, is there's too much data out there. Um, this might seem, yeah, as I say, slightly controversial, uh, but the trick is knowing what to collect. Providing one has access to a vehicle, a scene or a piece of infrastructure, for instance, it's all too easy to go slightly mad and collect loads of information on everything we see. And this is really great if we're trying to reconstruct in one individual crash, but not so useful if we're hoping to show trends or patterns across the numerous collisions. So an example of this would be air crash investigation, where complete risk reconstructions are done, so they almost rebuild the plane in the hangar. This isn't possible for every crash, and not necessary in most cases. We can find out most information without needing to do that. Um, we've been guilty of this in the past, to be honest, collecting enormous unwieldy data sets, which hold vast quantities of information, but we have to ask ourselves the question, what for? Certainly there's a risk that 70, maybe 80% of the data is never used for anything useful or constructive. Yeah, hugely expensive way of collecting ones and zeros in a database. And this is where we need to look at research questions. In order to avoid collecting loads and loads of stuff, we need to look at research questions and objectives. So I'm often asked by students about using collision investigation data, um, and the same patterns occur. They want everything as they don't know what they want to find. You know, they haven't clearly set out a research question or an objective. Um, and I, also, I, I kind of make them visualize being in a conference, standing in front of a couple of hundred people, and ask them, what, what's the graph behind you showing? What, what, what are you showing to the audience? And when you can visualize what that final data looks like, it's much easier to pick the variables and the data you need. And this helps determine things like what road users you need. Do you just need car occupants? Do you need all car occupants? Do you need just old occupants, young occupants? Who knows? Until you define these things. And also what crash types. Now, is it single vehicle crashes only you want? Is it reversing crashes? Is it fatal crashes? You need to be very clear on what you want to record. And that very quickly helps define the scope of data collection relevant to a specific question and helps us understand that actually there is too much data out there. So knowing your start point and knowing your end point are critical. We also need to be clear on what we want to achieve. So this is similar to the research questions slide. Um, we need to be careful to define what we're trying to find out and control. So an example of this might be that we have a site where we have a number of collisions and we want to reduce or remove them. So our data might be so varied and amorphous that we can't really come up with many uh, or one way of, of, of reducing that down. So we can only think of one countermeasure, so that's removing all the vehicles from the site. But that doesn't really match well with competing aims that influence this choice. We still clearly need to bring things in and out, to, in and out of the site. So we can't always reduce things down. So we need to be clear on what we want to achieve out of this. And that goes along with kind of this uh, graph here, which shows that safety goes up, efficiency can drop down. Um, and this is typical of very tightly regulated work practice, working practices, such as commercial air travel. So this is where the many choices in road safety have an effect on what data we collect. We need to align this data collection to this information. So for instance, the one I'll pick up there would be uh, sort of many pounds 
but safe versus few pounds but unsafe. You know, we have a choice of what we want to do, and there'll be a balance there of what we want to do. And the data we collect needs to support that answer. So we need to know whether the countermeasures we're coming up with are hugely expensive but very safe or very cheap but very unsafe, and we need to find that balance which is acceptable. Now, another problem we often encounter is that with large quantities of data, there is a race for solutions. And it's kind of human nature, really. You know, after all the expensive and time-consuming data collection, we need to find something. And this is, yeah, especially clear when people are dying. Um, what we need to be careful of is jumping to conclusions. And temptation is to pin the cause of a collision on one factor. So, for example, we have a crash with a, a poor overtake. We pin the cause of the collision on that poor overtake. And we ignore all the other factors that led up to that manoeuvre, such as lack of training, time pressures on the driver, lack of familiarity with a vehicle, attitudes to risk, because we think we know what's caused it. That's a very dangerous way of conducting accident investigation. So having a good structured investigation is part of the solution. We shouldn't assume that just because we conduct good investigations and collect reliable data that we'll find what we're looking for. And for this, we need to expand our investigation reach further than just the event. We need to look at the environmental factors, human factors, working practice, personal factors, amongst many others, to understand the root causes of these collisions. Now, collision investigation is a strange area. Um, much of the data we are collecting now, and many of the countermeasures developed from this data over the last decade, could take another 10 years before we see the effect in the collision data. So take, for example, for instance, uh, a new active technology, things like adaptive cruise control, we still don't see the effects of these on a large enough scale in in-depth collision data. Um, yes, technology's been out for 10 years, but it still exists in such small numbers that we, that we don't know what's happening out there. And the result of this is that, you know, like other areas of research, which have long durations, things like medical research, um, the area is very high risk. You know, if we're not careful, we can spend an awful lot of money and time and make things worse. So we know that investigations may not tell us everything we want to know. Uh, there will always be questions, which mean that the reasons behind some of the effects we see won't be fully explainable or understandable in the data we collect. So the example of this is we only, we're only looking at the failures rather than the successes. And we don't know why we won't see the successes because they won't appear in our collision data, and we need to understand the effect of those. Another useful uh, thing to remember is what to collect. Um, and for this, this, is, this figure is very useful. So most collision investigations involve some form of causation. It's kind of why we do it, we want to find out why, why it happened. Even police reported collision um, investigation that covers this. Um, it's very important to understand that causation and blame are not the same thing. But the image above shows the rough proportions of collision causation. You know, what can occur is that collision investigations focus heavily on the vehicle and environmental factors, as these are tangible and easy to record. And this neglects by far the largest area of human factors. You know, sometimes I think with good reason, because people are, you know, people change their stories, they don't fess up to things that it's not nice data to deal with. However, looking at the figure, we can see that human factors are the sole causation factor in around 65% of all crashes across all transport modes. Um, the figures for environmental vehicle as the sole factor are 3 and 2% respectively. And we need to be careful we aren't focusing on those 2 and 3% on their own and ignoring 65% of all their causation factors because it's difficult to deal with. The last thing I want to cover very briefly is sampling. Sampling basically means selecting crashes to investigate. This is a natural occurrence of almost all closed investigations, as it typically isn't possible to investigate all crashes, no matter how hard we try. Uh, we need to find a way of reducing the burden of investigation while targeting our energies, or while keeping the data quality and, and representativity high. Um, we want to reflect all crashes, or all the crashes we're interested in, without needing to investigate them all, and the trick is identifying how many we need. That is by far the hardest thing in the investigation plan. Um, there's no hard and fast rules, unfortunately, um, but it should be at least aligned to the research questions and objectives. So 
for instance, a reversing crash example, there's no use convenience sampling, so it's just doing the reversing crashes that occur outside their office window. If the most important and interesting reversing crashes happen at unsocial hours or in distant parts of the country, we need to make sure we're capturing a representative sample while we're, while we're reducing the number down. So, um, very, very brief, obviously, but um, we, I did say I won't be able to cover everything. But I hope that gives you a, a brief summary of the academic perspective of that investigation. So, any questions, happy to talk these through with anybody. Here's my contact details up there. So, thank you very much. Thank you, Steve. Um, that was a really interesting um, insight there into the uh, academic side of, of, of crash investigations. Um, I can see we have had a number of questions um, throughout, uh, which we'll come back to at the end of the webinar. So um, thank you uh, to those of you that have submitted questions, and, and please continue to do so. Um, for our second presentation, um, I'm delighted to welcome um, Loren De Costa from Volvo Truck Group Technology. Um, Loren is going to talk us through how Volvo Group undertake crash investigations and how they use um, the information that they uncover and collect. Um, Loren, over to you. Hello, my name is Laurent Costa. I'm working at the Volvo Truck Group Technology. I will present you how we investigate crash and how it helps us to improve the safety of our week. I'm working as a product owner for the Advanced Emergency Braking System. As well, I'm part of the Volvo Truck Accident Research Team. So safety is one of our commitments, is something that we have no question about, is something we do deliver, is something that we do have since this company has been created, is one of our main goal. But uh, today there is still a lot of fatalities. Worldwide is more than 1.2 million fatalities per year, which represent around 10 crash per day. I don't think that uh, every, uh, anybody will uh, take a plane in this case, but we all take our car to go to work. In Europe, it's around 36,000 fatalities per year. And in the part that I'm most interested in, it's 15% which are truck related. What does it mean? It means that around 3,000 800 fatalities uh, involve a truck in a crash. But what are we doing in Volvo to try to improve and limit our, our goal is to have zero accident at all on the road? So first we need to understand why crash happened, what are the root cause, and then we need to understand why and how we can avoid them. To do that, we have developed a team which we named Volvo Accident Research Team. This team has uh, been built in 1969 and since it's investigating uh, crashes all around the world. This team today has three main goals. The first goal is to investigate crash on site or off site. As we are located in Göteborg in, in Sweden, we investigate on site mostly in Sweden. But we are going all around the world for investigation, investigating off site crashes. Our second goal is to investigate uh, a statistic. So we are building statistics from different level, national level, European level, and even worldwide level, which give us results and uh, interesting information as a quarter measure in China will not have the same effect as in Europe. You can find all these results in a Volvo Truck Accident Research Survey. That's the link is at the end of this presentation. And the third goal of this team is to test the new feature that uh, Volvo Truck put in place to try to save life. But first, what caused the vehicle to crash? What are the main road codes? We do divide in two 
different step. We have first the post crash and the part before the crash. So if we start by the end, the post crash part, that's what we used to focus on on our accident research team. This means that after the crash happened, we went to the dealer and we look at the different parts, what are the deformation, what have happened, how does the passive safety did work, how does we manage to avoid, or what didn't work as well. From this investigation that we are performing by using 3D scanner, different uh, measure uh, tool, and by reading different data which are presented in the truck, we managed to create countermeasure that we can put in place in our, in our next product. But uh, just being at the dealer place is not enough to understand what happened and what we can do to avoid it. So we are trying to go on site crash to really see what was our environment, what can we do to meet our environment and maybe to avoid the crash in a curvature, for example, when there is a wall over. So that's what we have focused first. But nowadays, with new technology, we are coming more and more to the first part, to the pre-crash, what we name the safety impact sensement, to try to avoid the collision. And we are trying to put in place support functionality for the driver to avoid conflict in pre-crash situation. For example, in this situation, which is a really challenging situation for a driver, the driver here needs to do many things at the same time. He needs to take a safe distance with the vehicle ahead. He needs to keep in lane. He needs to keep a safe speed in the curve. He needs to, if he need, want to change lane, keep a good vision on what uh, is in the surrounding. And that's just a, a, a first example. For example, if the driver wants to turn in this uh, in this example, he cannot see if the car in front of is braking. The driver cannot see everything. That's why we have decided to identify all these different actions the driver needs to do. And for each action, we have developed a support functionality. For keeping a safe distance, we have developed a adaptive cruise control. To keep in lane, we have developed a lane keeping support. For detecting targets in the surrounding lane, we have a lane change uh, support. And we do have as well an advanced emergency braking system to avoid collision in case of rear end. But if we look now on the second goal, which is statistic. We can see a trend this last five years in uh, fatalities which involve trucks. So here we have differentiated in uh, fatalities which involve a truck occupants, car occupants, or vulnerable road user. We can see that uh, truck occupants and car occupants fatalities are decreasing. That was a goal that we had for five years ago, and that's what we see that we are managing. And we are quite happy about that. That means that the countermeasure we have on the passive side to get a better safety of the driver when he's seated in his truck or to keep the occupant of the car safer did work. But the new thing is when we look at for a vulnerable world user, we can see a really huge increase of fatalities. And that's a new challenge that we are looking at inside Volvo Truck to try to save the world world user life. If we look more in detail, I have tried in this uh, slide to represent a different scenario. Regarding truck occupants, uh, the biggest uh, crashes are all over, or trucks which are driving out of a curve, and rear-end accidents. For this difference, we have put in place support functionality to try to help the driver to avoid the crash. And we try as well to develop some passive safety functionality which can save driver life. 
we're getting uh, car occupant fatalities. The biggest is face-to-face -face, uh, fatalities. For this, we are trying to develop passive safety part to try to absorb a maximum the shock of the crashes. We can see as well as land change support is a quite big uh, part of crashes. And that's something that uh, we are focusing as well to try to reduce this part of accident. And now the last part, which is one of our user, and that's the uh, main focus that we are now inside the group. We can see three scenarios which we are focusing on. Two scenarios which involve the blind spot of the truck, one truck wants to turn right or left, depending on where does it drives. And he cannot see the bicycle which is on the side of the truck. So the accident or crash is with a vulnerable board user which are crossing the road and are looking at their smartphone, for example, which is coming more and more. So that's three actions we are developing right now inside the group. A short sum up about what our investigation have uh, gave us some feedback is a really simple action should, could save life. For example, if we take truck occupants fatalities, if only 50% of them are the seat belt, they will be still alive. Another thing is alcohol. Even if we do have alcohol, we are trying to put control measure, we can see that the alcohol is one of the major issues in most of these fatality accidents. The two other major issues is the speed and inundation of the driver who is doing different things at the same time with mobile phone as well, for example. So, in this slide, I have gave you some links to different reports and survey that uh, can help you to get more information on what we are doing inside the Volvo truck and uh, to improve our product, to analyze different uh, crash, and uh, to put in part control measure. Something that I want to uh, say as well is we are not looking only on crush, we try as well to educate people and we have a big education for child to know how to be around the truck. We do think that it's as important that our product evolve, but human mentality need to evolve as well. Thanks for your attention. Thank you, Laurent. Um, a great insight there into how Volvo Group um, approach crash investigations and how you then use that data um, to prevent future crashes. Um, please do continue to submit um, any questions you have for Laurent, um, which we'll come back to um, at the end of the webinar. Um, Laurent's presentation um, leads us nicely onto our final presentation of the day. Um, which, as I said at the beginning, is delivered by um, Andrew Drury from Broadspire. Um, Andrew is going to talk us through a case study which demonstrates the importance of prevention um, and really um, understanding and getting to grips with your risks. Um, Andrew is on jury duty today, um, so he's not available to, to answer your questions at the end of the webinar. Um, please do, though, submit any questions you have um, for Andrew throughout his, his presentation. Um, and we'll circulate his answers round at a later date. And uh, without further ado, we'll, we'll pass over to, to Andrew's presentation. Okay, this presentation is all about um, introducing uh, safety standards uh, across uh, global fleet safety. And the presentation is all about uh, prevention is better than cure and to know your risk, uh, to stop the risk. So the basis of the presentation is uh, on the case study, uh, the work that I've done with ONG Group UK Limited over a 15, 16 month period uh, to show how we implemented new processes for the group uh, to have consistency and to reduce and improve safety uh, across the group and reduce uh, collisions. 
the whole process started, uh, this is where it all began. Uh, and this shows the aftermath of a vehicle rollover involving a portable ton truck that had been loaded incorrectly. Uh, the problems we had uh, dealing with this matter were really to try and identify uh, what was the main cause of this incident. And once we'd established what the cause was with the vehicle being loaded incorrectly, which caused the rollover, um, we highlighted this to Owen's group and they were quite unaware of how these vehicles were being loaded, although they were driving these vehicles on the road on a day-to-day -day basis. So highlighted in the initial problems internally, and when we moved on um, and spoke to Owens directly, uh, we, done, we found out that they'd had a, quite a rapid expansion to 12 depots over a six to 12 month period, uh, increased from about seven depots initially, and their vehicles increased up to about 400 vehicles from 260 in a very short space of time. So the problems this exposed for them was each depot had an unconventional approach to risk. There was an inconsistent and incomplete reporting of collisions and investigations. Technology was not used to its full potential. There was no analysis of collisions and incidents. We had a diminished control over fleet risk management and road safety uh, procedures. And they didn't know what the potential and actual cost of uh, their exposure from the collisions and incidents uh, was uh, against the company, which was really leaving them open to significant losses and problems internally. And they also had problems uh, with loading issues from third party individuals as shown in the initial slide and the photographs there, which had a potential uh, to lead to fatal and catastrophic collisions. So we needed to break the mould uh, within the group. So a six months action plan was um, agreed with the health and safety manager uh, and the board implemented um, a zero tolerance for reporting and investigating all incidents. Whether they were collisions, incidents or near misses, regardless of how serious or minor they were, fault or non-fault, injury or no injury, claim or no claim from the third parties involved. It really didn't matter what the, what the incident involved, we had to deal with this uh, to show to the board what the potential exposure was. So having agreed the six months action, uh, agreed the six months action plan with the board, we had to put it into practice and this is what it looked like. Reporting processes were centralised with the health and safety manager. All incidents were reported immediately and the health and safety manager uh, was the only person to instruct uh, for the investigations within 48 hours of an incident happening. This enabled uh, control of all the instructions that and investigations that needed undertaken. So the driver was interviewed within 48 hours um, of an instruction. Uh, additional investigations were carried out with witnesses and um, visits to the collision locations if need be, and, and in-depth interrogation of the telematics data and technology data. And then a formal report was provided back to the health and safety manager within seven days of instruction. And then this report contained details of all our findings, uh, what the potential risks were, what the trends were, and if, on, um, if there was no remedial action taken, uh, what the potential uh, consequences could be going forward. So we had to then continually uh, manage the data and analysis, identifying the root causes and trends. We also undertook two day, days of collision investigation and analysis training with all the depot managers, so they fully understood what was required from the investigations and the processes. And all the processes met uh, the requirements for industry standards within the UK for fours and clocks. So what changed once uh, the results and what the results were achieved? Well, first of all, there was robustly managed work-related road risk policy implemented and improved road safety. All depot managers worked to the same standards and processes and timely and consistent reporting on, and investigations were carried out. Improved problem areas um, with third party suppliers uh, to reduce the risk from uh, poorly loaded vehicles. An improved driver handbook. And most importantly, 
improved employer and employee engagement. This is vital because um, there was a perception that the management weren't listening to the employees and the employees weren't listening to the management. So we were able to act as a, a conduit for the uh, two parties to, to bring them together and start listening to each other. So overall, there was an improved employee behaviour, so which equaled a valued driver, which equaled a happy driver, which led to a safer driver. So what did this do to the business and what things did they find out? The main things were, all potential risks within the fleet were identified and identified root causes and trends. Recommendations based on facts and not assumptions. Um, so this led to the need analysis and improvement as it was quite clear that risks continue to change. The exact, exact cost of potential exposure from, the, from fleet risk was identified and this totaled almost around about £1.4 million pounds over the 12 month period and the collision rate for the vehicles was uh, reduced to 7% against industry averages of 25%. And what we also identified was safety does not cost because the potential savings were in excess of £700,000. I think from a, a business perspective the board were able to make decisions based on fact and not uh, assumptions. So lastly, we learned prevention is better than cure. By investing uh, initially to stop the risks, uh, saved a lot more money than reacting, reacting to the incident once it happened. Thank you, Andrew. Um, a number of really important messages there, particularly at the end. Um, that brings our formal presentations um, to a conclusion um, today. Um, we have had a number of questions um, throughout during the presentations. Um, as we start to answer those, um, please submit any additional questions you have um, via the comments box or please raise your hand and we will unmute you. Um, first up is a question for Steve. Um, Steve, you mentioned the need for efficient data collection. If we want to reduce the risk of human factors, what are the key pieces of data that I, as a fleet manager, would need to collect to identify the root causes? Uh, there's some very good little um, methodologies with uh, human factors. You can do a lot of human factor plans and trees. So uh, you really don't need to look at vehicles or infrastructure. I would. Um, you know, if, you, if you're really just, just concerned with human factors, focus on your drivers and focus on what elements they provide to the crashes. As I say, 65% of all crashes are human factors. So you will collect a vast amount of information on, on information from there. You think of police investigations, most of their focus will be on the interviews in, in cases. It's a massively rich resource in there. Again, you need to focus on not collecting too much information, but but focusing on on the driver's views and that kind of stuff is is, is critical. And and in, in some ways, if you're really only focusing on human factors, that is a, a massive step above what most people will be able to do in collision investigations, because they will they will, as I said, they will focus on vehicles and infrastructure more than anything else. Okay, um, thank you, Steve. I hope hope that answered your question. Um, We've had a, a, a number of questions actually around a um, similar theme um, here um, around um, new technology um, and the impact that um, that has on investigations. So I think I'll just um, read a couple of these questions out, but I think these are actually you know, potentially for Steve and, and Laurent to, to respond to. Um, so the first question is, how is um, technology such as telematics and the increased use of dash cams, et cetera, impacting on, impacting on uh, crash um, investigations? Um, and is the impact all positive? Um, and the, the second part of that, which is another question, is how is video helping with um, collision investigation? Um, so two two questions there, but linked questions, I think. So Steve and Laurent, I don't know whether you have a response to those. Uh, yeah, can you hear me? 
Yes. Yeah. Fantastic. Um, actually, we've we've done quite a lot of work with with video uh, stuff as well. The it's still small numbers. Again, things like uh, autonomous cruise control and things like that. You're still seeing small numbers in the fleet. But we've done some studies here with naturalistic driving and, and filming people when they drive and looking at their events. And uh, this is a, a slight, well, uh, the negative view of it, I, I guess, is reviewing video over and over again from your desk with the hindsight of knowing what's about to happen can be potentially very misleading. It's very easy to to, to replay the video three or four times and go, oh yeah, I can understand why they, you know, I can, I can, I could have seen what was, what was happening there. Why didn't they see it? I think you have to be careful that the driver only gets one go at those, those situations, and they're generally a surprise. So watching the video five or six times at your desk in the comfort and on, on slow motion or freeze frame sometimes is a little bit misleading. But they are a massively rich resource. Again, much like interview data, uh, I think. Um, we don't see a lot of it, but we have used video before. Um, the other, another side of it would also be the in-vehicle data that's collected. I think Laurent might be able to um, say a bit more about that, which is the kind of crash recorders and stuff that are in vehicles. They are a little bit difficult to get hold of from a third-party point of view. Uh, obviously, it's quite um, highly protected data in there. Uh, if you could reverse engineer things like your algorithms for how your uh, autonomous vehicle controls work, then uh, Tesla aren't gonna, really going to give that away. So if you're looking at crash recording and that kind of stuff that's recording the vehicle systems, that's quite difficult. But I think the video data is very, very valuable, providing you're aware of the pitfalls of reanalyzing the same thing, I guess. That's, that'd be my, my major, major point I'd bring up from looking at a lot of video data before. Okay, thanks Steve. Laurent, do you have, do you have anything you'd like to, to add to, to, to Steve's comments there? Yeah, you do. You hear me well? Yeah, we can hear can you. Can you thanks. hear me? Yeah. Uh, I agree totally with what Steve said, that the video give us another view of the event and as he said, we when we get the video we do need to do an investigation before and after the video because uh, the video can give us some tips but uh, it can lead us to some uh, wrong uh, conclusion as well. On all sides, the video really helped us when it came to all the active safety functionality, what I named uh, advanced emergency braking and adaptive cruise control. And it uh, provides us really um, interesting data to understand how the function did work, if it worked well or not, and to understand where was a failure in uh, the uh, crash. Uh, as well, uh, uh, we do have access, thanks to the telematic, to data which are recorded during crash event, so we can uh, reconstruct, I don't know, uh, rebuild uh, what the event and try to understand what was the cause of the crash and if we can do anything to avoid the crash in uh, the future or to really understand what was the root cause. So that's something which gave us more data and helped us to be better. Okay, thank you. Thank you both for that. Um, a couple of other questions um, for you both. Um, how um, do you rate the value of online assessments and e-learning classroom training um, and one-to-one -one driver training on reducing incidents, um, either reactionary or preventative. So I think it's you know, a question around you know, the process of that um, you know, learning and, and training provided to, to drivers. How, how would either of you, um, you recommend that that is best delivered? Should I jump in on that one? Um, <laughs> I'll start off by saying I don't have much experience of the, the training side of things. Um, our clients, shall we say, that we see in collisions are very much more of the seriously injured level. So we don't have very much that. But we have worked with some training things before um, and feedback based on events that we may see and play back. Again, I, I, I cover my same, the same uh, 
point I made about the video data, it's, it's very easy to, lead, to come up with misleading answers if you review um, video back, particular other data. But if you're looking at a certain error type, then I think, you know, I've, I've read some good things and I've seen some good things about, you know, feedback and training. I think feedback is the main thing, cl closing that loop. I think if you're collecting a lot of data, you have to then continue to keep providing that support back to the drivers. Otherwise, if it's in a bit of a, a wishy-washy approach, um, uh, a bit here and a bit there, it, it perhaps loses its effect. Again, not really my area, but we've done a little bit with things like competitive um, sort of ranked uh, driver scoring systems, and they do seem to work well, but you do need to really buy into them completely. You, you, I don't think you can do this sort of just pick up on the worst drivers or the best drivers. I think it needs to be across the board. It's, it's my experience, but again, not, not totally my area, unfortunately. Thanks, Steve. Uh, Laurent, do you have anything you'd like to, to add to that? Uh, it's not really my area as well. Uh, I work to train the aftermarket people on my side. But I never get uh, on any customer training, so I'm, I don't, yeah, I don't have uh, any data on this. Okay, thank you. Uh, no, that's fine. Thank, thanks, Laurent. Uh, I mean, it's certainly from you know from 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 our perspective um, here here at Break. I mean, to to echo some of the the points made there by by Steve. Um, you know, obviously, you know the the, the training, um, be, be it you know classroom training, one to one driver training. Um, is you know is, is fundamentally important, but then um, you know the processes, procedures, and management um, you know of of everything that comes after that um, is is fundamental to uh, you know to making sure that you know the training has had the you know, the impact that it that it needs to have had, and you know having the processes in place to you know to track and, and enforce and um, you know investigate anything that that follows. Um, you know, it, it's fundamental to to that you know to the success of um, you know to to the success of that training really. Um, okay, we had a, another question um, that's come through. Um, is there a standard um, or a methodology for road crash investigation um, available for enterprises? Um, I'm not sure, Steve uh, or Laurent, whether you have a uh, any knowledge around that. Uh, there will be. Um, there are things like the Police Road Death Investigation Manual, which are publicly available. Um, that's a good place to start, but it will obviously be slightly tweaked towards the police's viewpoint. Um, a lot of the other ones aren't really. They're not. They're not publicly available because they tend to be either government provided, um, or so the, the work we've been on was uh, a huge project since 1984, building up and building up and building up. So it's not something, A, that's easily available, and B, I'd recommend to just roll out because it is hugely overwhelming. Something like, I calculated the other day, it's something like 6,500 different variables we collect. So, you know, one case can have 20, 30,000 pieces of data inv involved in that. It's, 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 that's not something I'd recommend anybody goes and does unless they're really keen on doing huge amounts of accidents. Um, it, re it very much, I think, goes from the point I was trying to, to raise, very much should be focused on what you want to find out. If, you, if you're only looking at site-based collisions, then you can al almost come up with some ideas of how you might want to frame that anyway. Or if you want to look at it, it, it very much depends on your research questions, what you want to find out. Um, I don't know if there's anything you'll be able to just say, right, here's a manual. We will go and do that. Um, I can provide some pointers and some tips if you want to get in contact, um, but it's not something I don't think you can just print off and go ahead and go and do, really. Okay, thank you, Steve. Um, okay, a couple more questions. Um, is there, and this is, I think, similar to, to a discussion we've, we've had um, earlier, um, is there any data relating to the effectiveness of driver training um, and the time span that, that said training um, remains evident? Um, Steve, Ron, I'm happy to, to take a, a steer from, from, from you on that. In terms of um, you know, any, any data that I'm, I'm aware of um, 
I, I'm not. I mean, I think it goes back to the to, to the points we've we've made previously around, um, you know, the, the the training certainly does does have a real real impact and a real benefit, but it is then, um, you know, the protocol and procedures that are put in place um, around that training and following that training, um, you know, so management buy-in, having processes to, um, you know, to track and measure and monitor. Um, you know, driver behaviour, um, and to do something um, with with the data that you are then getting back. Um, Steve, look, Laurent, do you have do you have anything yeah. to, to add specifically around there? I, I would agree that it's more it's more long term than just that bums on the seat in the car. Um, we've we've been doing actually got a, a piece of work here at the moment. We're working with um, kids in deprived areas, looking at their driving. So a slightly different group. And we have seen on the on the initial study, we have seen some good results that lasted without subsequent training. Um, so they did they did some driving in their own cars. We also provided a uh, advanced driver training um, sort of intervention at four periods and picked up on some of the major things, really really high level stuff like look further ahead and slow in, fast out type stuff, no, nothing like shuffling the wheel and that kind of stuff. And, and that seemed to stick for as long as we followed them for, but obviously they've got a lot further to go and we, we obviously can't follow them forever. Um, so that it may well go back to the, the baseline driving, I don't know. Driving is one of those things that um, it's bad behavior gets self-reinforced because you don't have because crashes are rare and um, so you we very often see people or interview people at scenes and they say well I've been reversing out of my drive for 30 years and never had a crash and I think it doesn't, doesn't it's never meant, meant it's safe it just means you've been lucky and I think every time you're lucky it reinforces that what you're doing is safe if you sort of mean so you think oh that, that's good I'll carry on doing that so I think Unless you continue with the intervention and keep reinforcing those messages, bad behaviour creeps back in, and it, it, it the driver self reinforces the fact that it's safe because they don't have very many crashes. Um, does that make sense? <laughs> I think I might have just talked round around in a circle there. No, it, it does. Um, thank you, Steve. Um, and and just one. Um, one sorry. sorry, go, go on, Laurent. Sorry. Uh, uh, for me, when you when we're speaking about training, I'm thinking about two different area. I was I'm thinking that there is an area where you can train someone to uh, to drive more fuel efficient or to be less stressed in traffic. So it's uh, general behavior on long terms, and this is something which is takes quite some time to get, and it's quite hard for a driver to uh, assimilate it and. Uh, what we have seen in our study is that drivers need to get something back to to really manage it. So I know that there is uh, studies from insurance which they have put some uh, speedometer, and depending on you following the speed or not, you get some uh, bonus on your insurance. That's something which makes people change their way of driving and to drive safer. Uh, the other way of training is. Today, as you uh, said, there is coming a lot of new functionality which are more, more autonomous and it's new functionalities that people need to learn how to use as well. This type of training can be really quicker. Okay, so thank questions. you. No, thank you for that, Laurent, that's really useful. Um, okay, and one final question. This is a very specific one um, for you here, Steve. Um, but we, we will share this one for, for the benefit of everyone else too. Um, do um, do Loughborough run any basic courses for um, fleet manager level um, around um, collision investigation? That's one for you, Steve. Uh, we haven't, but we could. Uh, we do we do a number of training. We do a lot of training. Some of those pictures in my presentation were lots of training for um, other countries and places like that. Um, we. Haven't I don't think recently done anything at that level, but I'm sure our background and stuff will cover. We can develop something. I was just thinking again, going slightly off, going back to the previous question about 
accident investigation methodology that you could just use. Um, there are some European projects that have those. Um, there was a, a project called Safety Net, which had an accident investigator. It's fatal based, and there was a project called, was that Dakota, which looked at a um, coming up with a European-wide accident investigation sort of methodology. But I think it's all a bit too high level. Again, I think it's all about very, very much forensic measurements of vehicles. So a lot of the stuff, as I kind of mentioned before, is filling ones and zeros into boxes, which are very much not needed. So we, we don't at the moment, um, and we haven't done for a while, but that is something we, would, we can definitely do. That is something where our background is, is very much based. OK, thank you, Steve. Um, OK, that brings us to um, an end of today's webinar. Um, if you have any further questions, um, at all, then please drop us an email and we're, we're more than happy um, to, to answer those for you um, offline. Um, I'd just like to say a massive thank you um, to our three um, speakers today, um, and in particular to, to Steve and Laurent uh, for, for dialing in and joining us live today and answering um, your questions. Um, we will um, shortly be issuing um, a feedback form um, following today's webinar, um, which would be great if you could all um, complete and provide back to us. Um, and we'll also be releasing details about our program of webinars and events for 2018. Um, so please keep an eye out for those um, as well. Um, following this webinar, um, we will be putting a recording of the webinar on um, to uh, YouTube in the coming weeks. And we will um, circulate um, a message um, around to you all, uh, letting you know where you can find that. And a copy of the slides will be made um, available um, to you as well, should you like them. So once again, um, thank you very much to our speakers, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar. Thank you. <laughs>